Thank you, Doug. Well, I'll tell you what, since the time I uh, first came here, a bunch of you said, I sure would like to learn about one specific area in the scripture as to what it says, because there's so much ignorance out there on the area of money. I'd like you to turn to, we're going to study that which you do not have, most of you. Uh, a lot of things we can look at. I'd like you to look uh, at Deuteronomy chapter 8, that fifth book of the Pentateuch there, and you might wonder why we'll look at that, and I'll show you. What I'm going to give here is a, a topical overview on the biblical area of money. I don't know if you realize it, but there is more in the uh, Bible on the issue of money uh, than there is on the um, on about what heaven and what hell are like. Not more information there as opposed to how one gets there, but uh, as far as just what money is used for. Because it gets us in so much trouble that God gives us an enormous amount of material. So what I'm going to do tonight is give you about seven uh, an overview of seven different biblical aspects of money, of what money is and how money is used. And then I'm going to show you uh, three biblical problems that you get into because of money. Now the first thing is, you have to understand about money, is where it comes from. Deuteronomy chapter 8, the uh, duet nomos is the second law that God was giving to, to the new generation of Jew who was going into the land, the first generation, wiped out in the uh, wilderness wanderings for their sin and their unbelief. And so you have a new generation going in. Uh, the Old Testament says that the wicked saves up for the righteous. And God took these wicked Canaanites and he took their land and he gave it to the people of his sovereign pleasure, Israel. And so in verse 11, in light of the fact that the nation is about to get this enormous gift of land, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11, God says, Beware lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments. And the reason they could forget is because of verse uh, 7 down through verse 10. The Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, fountains, springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills of wheat and barley, vines, figs, pomegranate, olive oil, honey, a land where you, shall lack, where you shall eat without scarcity, which you shall not lack anything, the land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And when you have eaten and are satisfied and blessed the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you, beware lest you forget. And he talks about forgetting the fact that when verse 12 after you have eaten and are satisfied and built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiplies and all that you have multiplies, then your heart becomes proud and you forget the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the land of slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness with fiery serpents, scorpions, thirsty ground where there was no water and brought water for you out of the rock. In the wilderness he fed you with manna which your fathers didn't know, that he might humble you, that he might test you to do good for you in the end, otherwise you may say in your heart, verse 17, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God. It is he who is giving you the power to make wealth that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. The first issue about money, you have to understand, is that money is something that is given from God to glorify God. And you and I are custodians. We are called stewards. And the biblical issue of giving is called the doctrinal issue of stewardship. A steward owns nothing but he is responsible for everything. You and I are stewards of what God gives us. This ability you have to earn, no matter how much it is, is not a, an ability that you concocted. Maybe you refined it. But the ability to make wealth, and for that matter, the ability to spend it. If God shuts off the heavens and we have no bread, your money and my money is worthless. And so the first area of, of intelligence in the area of money is that God has given you a body to function, 
that is relatively healthy, a mind that is relatively astute, and he has given you certain raw abilities. And if God is so pleased, he can take those. We are told to honor him in what he has given us. Now, all of you have a certain ability to make some money. Uh, some of you, and here's the way that money is made, uh, when you look at wealth. Uh, there are some people who are wealthy because they have the great ability to turn nickels into quarters. They can just farm money. And there are fellows in my church that are very astute people uh, at putting down quarters and get, or nickels and getting back quarters. They just have the ability. They're generally very humble people uh, that just recognize a God-given ability and they use that money. Uh, these are very close friends of mine. I keep them near to my bosom. All right. No, they, they are really talented, though, in making money. And maybe some of you have that ability. Not many of you do. I don't, but maybe some of you do. It's not necessarily that you're brilliant. You just know how to put it in, when to take it out, when to move it around. Um, some of you can make a lot of money because you have a particular talent that at this time in history in this country is highly remunerated. Um, I have a particular ability, and as a pastor, uh, no matter how great a guy gets, a pastor generally of a, of a church that's, let's say, the size of mine, if you take, and I'll just be honest with you, uh, my salary and my perks and outside speaking and everything that I do all right, will come every year to write out about $100,000. I've been doing it for 25 years. We've got a church of 3,000 people. I speak nationally for three organizations, and that's what I make. If I had a different ability, let's say the ability of a brain surgeon, number one, we'd be in trouble, all right? And number two, uh, that particular ability is going to get a whole lot more than that. I've got a dear friend that studied approximately the same time as I did in school. He happened to have ability in ear, nose, and throat and put in a lot of time. Uh, he makes nigh unto half a million dollars a year in all the stuff that he does. Some of you have an ability that at this point of history will happen to give you a lot of money. Most of us are not in this category. We're going to run in about the 25000 to about 100000 area, depending upon the ability you have. That's the way it is. But you can't get any big, substantial difference in lifestyle. Maybe you get a different kind of car, more square feet. Maybe you have a uh, moped as opposed to a jet ski, all right? And the things that you enjoy, you shop at this place as opposed to this place, but substantially there's no big difference. Now that's one way that you make money. The other way that you can make a lot of money gets to be kind of dangerous, and that's where you gamble. As far as taking money and investments, the problem is you might lose it, and if you make a lot of money this year, you have to keep matching it year after year. And so investments can be a great problem. Some guys can live on the edge like that. Another way you can make a lot of money is you can be crooked. Um, anything that deals with evil, you can generally make a lot of money. The problem is uh, you end up losing it and you go to hell, and that's a real bad deal. <laughs> So if you're going to make a lot of money in pornography or uh, running dope, all right, you can make a lot of money. But there's a payment there at the end. You don't want to try that. Uh, another way you can make a lot of money, incidentally, the way that most of us, if we get materialistic, the way we're going to try to, that we're going to foul up is we're going to try to get rich quick that becomes a folly and a shame. Book of Proverbs. Uh, by doing stupid things. The other way you try to, that you can, normal guys like most of us can get rich, whatever that is, is by working 80 to 100 hours a week. And those kind of people exchange money usually for happiness and family. I could make, if I wanted to, another $40,000 a year if I was willing to be gone on my weekends. I will not exchange my wife and children for money. It's not that important to me. So, let me just get very practical. Most of you, me, in here, 99.9% .9 of us are people that have a particular ability that gets remunerated at the area of about twenty-five dollars to $100,000 a year, most of us in the bottom, and it's never going to change that much. And that's okay. It really is. You work hard, make all the money you can with your ability, do all the good that you have, and remember, that money and the ability to make it comes from God. He gives it, and he can take it away if he is pleased. Secondly, 
Not only is money a gift, but money is used biblically to worship. In the nation of Israel, there was an offering called a grain offering. And that was when a Jew would take part of what God gave him of the earth, and he would offer it up with an oil and frankincense, and it was a sweet aroma in the presence of heaven. And it was a thank you to God for what he gave him. It was a means of worship. Um, in the New Testament, there's a number of believer, of believer sacrifices, the sacrifice of self, the living holy sacrifice, the sacrifice of praise through the lips that gives thanks to his name. Um, there's the... Um, a sacrifice of souls that we offer to God, uh, Romans 15. But another sacrifice is that of giving. The book of Philippians was written because the Philippian believers sent money to the Apostle Paul in prison. And Paul wrote them back and he said, I have received what you have sent. This is Philippians 4.18. A fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Biblically, the giving of a believer, be it an Old Testament Jew or a New Testament Christian, is an act of worship. That when you take a check in your local church and you put it in a box and you're saying, God, I give you this simply out of the love of what you have given me and in my love of the body of Christ and to promote the program here that the word of God can be proclaimed, missionaries can be provided for, that's an act of worship. When you sign on a check, it's a doctrinal statement that says, God, everything that I have comes from you, and I give a token to thank you. In the Old Testament, you tenthed. That's what the word tithe means. The children of the Old Testament were taxed for breathing God's air, living on God's land that he gave, and eating of God's food. And they paid a tax to God. They spent the seventh day recognizing that everything they had was from God, and they worshiped and they rested. In the New Testament, the term tithe is not mentioned. Frankly, it's because it would be an insult to a Christian to take a mature son or daughter of God that has been converted by the enlightenment of Christ, whose soul has been wed to God in sonship and in familial love, and to tax them like children to do what is right, to say, you get this, we want this. That is an insulting thing. The New Testament Christian is told to give. To give not out of his wealth, but to give according to his wealth. What's the uh, model of giving in the New Testament? The widow that gave everything that she had. So men saw what she gave, Jesus saw what she kept. Men saw the check, Christ saw the stub. And he was impressed with that woman. The New Testament Christian doesn't tithe. We give according to the standard of Christ. How much should a New Testament Christian give? Well, it's this. Here's the way you give. Imagine if we could take you, try you six times, find you innocent six times, and then uh, beat you senseless, pull the beard out of your face, um, beat your back and take the skin from it, take thorns and cram them into your brow, drive nails into your hands, let your fa family, friends, loved ones, and nation spit on you, renounce you, gossip of you, slander you, curse you, then let God curse you. Now, what would you be willing to pay to get out of that? Whatever the substitution of Jesus Christ for you is worth, you should give. <laughs> give no more than the death and resurrection of God's incarnate Son is worth to you. Now, your statement is, Tom, that's loaded. The death of Christ to me is everything. And the fact is, that is what Jesus Christ gave for the program. Like David of old who built the temple and gave over one million dollars to its starting, Jesus Christ, to the building of its temple, his temple, gave everything to build it. So the standard of giving is to sell everything that you have, give it, and then die. Now you're saying that's a pretty steep price. None of us can give that. No. But that's the standard of the author and the finisher of our faith.
And so we all give what we can. And God would much rather, I think, be, quote, shortchanged by an immature Christian than he would to insult the souls of the mature. You give according to what Christ gave to you. You give what you can. Out of love. Um, great principle. Proverbs uh, chapter uh, 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. He'll direct your paths. A couple of verses later states, Honor God with the first fruits of your produce, that your barns will be overflowing and your vats overflowing with sweet wine. The first area of trusting God with your heart and leaning not on your understanding is in giving, in Proverbs chapter 3. What would you think is the way to collect money, to hoard? What's the Bible say? Give. It's an act of faith. And so this is something, folks, that when I was a young Christian, the guy that discipled me started. And he was a, um, the fellow that discipled me was named John McCain. He was a University of Iowa wrestler. He won real subtle. And he said to me, young man, you can talk all you want about your love for Christ. He said, if it can't reach your pocketbook, he said, you're just talking. Now, that may insult you, but men, frankly, need to be spoken to like that. I needed the nuts and bolts on the table. And that's what he said. And he said, how much do you get a week of laundry money? I said, I get 15 a month. He said, let's take $3. And let's just take 20% and give it to God. And you know what? Uh, that started in my life when I was 21 years of age, early on. And it became a principle all the way through the rest of my life. And I'm here to tell you, it works. Honor God with your first fruits, and he'll take care of all the rest. Give, and it shall be given. My God shall supply your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ. So, may I ask a very pointed question? Are you part of a fellowship of Christians, and on Sunday you come under the authority of that body, listen to the word, worship the God of grace, and that you give out of your best to honor God. And we do. We give the first day of the week. We don't, as Christians, reach into our pockets and give God what the restaurants didn't get. We just don't cast in the useless. We give God from our best, like he did from us. So money, first, is from God. And secondly, it's a means to worship and to honor what he's done. You want a great verse? Ruin your day? Malachi, behold, you are robbing God, saith the Lord. That's how God sees a Christian, an Old Testament Jew, that failed to honor him with what he had. God said, frankly, you're driving stolen cars. You are wearing stolen clothes. You are enjoying money and stolen entertainment. So it's his money that we honor him with. Take number three. What is financial security? The Bible says that financial security is if we have food and covering. With these we shall be content. Jesus said God covers the flowers and he feeds the sparrows. Food and covering uh, are the basic uses of money. Everything else is gratis to be enjoyed or to be used. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. Let me hit an issue with you. What about loans? What does the Bible say about loans? It never says categorically that you are in evil if you are in debt. God told the nation Israel you could not loan to a Jew at interest. You could loan to the nations and provide them immediate money and they would pay you an interest. But you couldn't do it and take advantage of your own brethren. So if loaning is evil, God encouraged the nation Israel to do so. Now, it's not that easy for just to have a standard rule that you're, if you're in debt, you're in sin. But the Bible does tell us some things about loans. One, the borrower is the lender's slave. Amen? Yes. When you are in debt, they own you. That's the way it is. 
and you have to make an obligation. In other words, if you come to me and say, uh, Tommy, boy, Denton Bible goes overseas three times a year. I'd love to go with you. What's it cost to go to the Ukraine and preach? Well, the whole deal's about $2,500. Well, I think I can have that. I'm going to have to default on a couple of payments. And what I say to you is, you are not free to go in mission. Romans 13, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. You've got to pay your debts. And so the bank owns you. And so you don't get to go. And that's the way it is. Um, my wife and I uh, stay away from uh, credit card debt because there's nothing more accommodating to the flesh to see something you like, put down the plastic, <coughs> and walk off with it. That's a great joy, all right? Uh, so we try to stay away from that. Uh, we owe on a house and whatever my wife racked up yesterday. I'm not sure. But that's about it. She tends to incur more than me. And the reason is, is because I want to be free. I want to be able to do whatever it is that God wants me to do. So we don't have a lot of debt. As a matter of fact, I'm ashamed to say it, we're not that organized in our checkbook. Uh, we kind of scrape everything together at the end of the month and see how we're doing. Because we don't have debt. So you've got to pay your debts. Um, what is there for a loan? It's like... Um, when you get in debt for something, it's like a, a pet anaconda in your home. It's nice, it's pretty, but if it gets wrapped around you, it'll crush the life out of you. A loan can help you in a home, in a car. You may have something that you've gotten a loan on, but if it gets to wrapping around you, it will crush the life out of you. So be careful about getting in debt. Uh, as a matter of fact, the couples that we get with the biggest marital problems, they go uh, communication, money, sex, and in-laws. But money is one of the great causes of problems, getting into debt. So money is used for basics. If we have food and covering, I see no naked people among us, praise God. Um, <laughs> If financial security is food, um, you all look like you are prospering. Um, some of you are uh, rolling in the big bucks, as I can see. <laughs> so that's all right. Now, are you with me, gang? You see what we're doing? Money is of God. It is used as an act of worship, and it is used primarily for basics. Fourthly, believe it or not, money biblically is used for fun. It's a dangerous thing to be telling you guys, I got a feeling. Y'all are a, a uh, fun bunch, but money, I can show you more information in the Bible on the use of money for enjoyment than I can for the use of money in saving. To be quite honest, the Bible doesn't put a big stock in saving. Do you know that? As a matter of fact, the only guy in the Bible that is called fool by God is a guy that was passionate towards saving. Um, the Bible says in 1 Tim 6, God gives us all things to enjoy. The Jew, once a year, had a second tithe that he would take up to Jerusalem and he would spend it on anything, quote, your heart desires. They had fun with it. Um, enjoy your creator all the days of your youth. Enjoy the wife of your youth. And then it tells you to let your clothes be white at all times and your head never ceasing from oil that's what you did at a party Ecclesiastes enjoy life um, I can show you more biblical information on a Christian spending money to go on a ski trip which is where I was as of yesterday <laughs> than I can um, on a lot of other issues that look more pious money is to be enjoyed um, one of the great blessings my wife and I have is that of spontaneity just dropping our money on things that we like to do uh, heading off someplace just to be together so enjoy it fifthly money is to be used for benevolence Jesus said if you have two cloaks be on the alert for the fellow that doesn't have but one or has none Watch out for him. 
Uh, where would the church have been in the first century without Barnabas that sold a tract of land and gave it to the church to take care of those that had been excommunicated possibly and lost their jobs? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, about the righteous man. He scatters abroad. He gives to the poor. His righteousness abides forever. Use your money for great benevolence. Tell you what my wife and I do. We get our check. We give right off the top to the Lord's work. We take the rest of it and we pay our house, our bills. Then we get our food. And then the rest of it, we have a little amount that we put in savings. But we have a lot left over. And we do a lot of good. We're able to give away a lot of money. And it's fun for us, uh, and we enjoy the rest of it. Uh, when I went over to uh, um, uh, Russia a couple of few months ago, that was such a marvelous trip, and I got really close to my translator. Her name was Galena. And she is about a 50-plus year old woman that loves Christ. And I stood with her by the Volga River, and her eyes filled up with tears. And she said, I would love to be able to see America. She makes the grand total of 20 bucks a month as an English teacher. Uh, she's been waiting uh, 12 years to get a flat. She lives in an apartment kind of flat with three generations, her mother and her children, she and her daughter. She has saved for 12 years. She has 400 American dollars. It costs 2000 for an apartment. And I don't know if she's ever going to get it. She dreams. She stood there with tears coming down her cheeks about being able to see the United States. She's an English major study. And um, I said to her, what if I brought you over here? Well, I made a couple of calls, and I can get her a flight on Lufthansa. Um, they have a flight that goes out of Russia called Airflop, they call it. And uh, it's an adventure tours to do that. And I didn't want to bring her over here with the chickens and goats. I wanted her to have a real good flight. And Lufthansa will fly her to Frankfurt, from Moscow to Frankfurt to Dallas. Uh, I checked up. It, it runs about 1160 right now to get her a round trip. Uh, to get a train ride 17 hours to the west from Chebaksari to Moscow is going to cost some money. She doesn't have it. I talked to my wife. And what would you ladies do if your husband came to you and said, hey, Let's cut a check for 11 over here, and then let's give her some money on the trip, and then let's us take out of our pocket and put her up. And you know what I might do when she gets over here? I might surprise her with a, and get the money together and give her a flat to buy one. That just warms my heart to be able to do that, that at this point I'm in a place in this country with the money I make that I can give away uh, a couple of thousand dollars. Not all times am I able to do that. I can do it right now. And we're going to do it. And I just want to see the face uh, on a Russian lady coming out and just showing her uh, the blessing that God has given this country. She said to me with wide eyes, do you own a car? <laughs> Over there, if you own a car, there are these rap trap things and, and you let people flag you down on the road and you give them rides for rubles. Do you own a car? I said, yes, ma'am, I do. My wife does. My son's got a Jeep. My other one's got a Toyota. She said, well, do you live in an apartment? No. Do you have a house? Yes. Her flat's about 600 square feet. How big is your flat? Do you have 1,000 feet? Keep going. <laughs> to the, yes, ma'am, I got about 2,500 square feet in this thing. Just can't believe what God has given. I want to watch her get off the plane. I want to bring her around. I want to bring her here. Show her you guys. Show her this church. And so use your money for good. It's a great tool. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in Luke 16, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon that when your money runs out, they, the people you helped, may receive you into eternal dwellings. You can use money to establish a friendship, to share the gospel with a soul uh, that will never ever run out. Use your money. Sixthly, 
Money is to be used for security, in a sense. Listen to the proverb. There is precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but the foolish man swallows it up. Meaning a fool, as soon as he gets his money, he gobbles it. But a wise man, there is tr precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise. He has some set up. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, do not parents save up for children, not children for parents. I have a little money we've been able to put aside and I can get my son started in a college program. I've got money set aside and saved up that when I die, my wife can enjoy the life that she has because of my saving up. We save up to where when I'm 65 years of age, uh, we've got money there to take care of us. And so we have a little bit of savings. So save. Good thing to do. Seventhly, money is used biblically to promote the work of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 forbids pastors taking a, a job. Do you know that? Timothy, do not entangle yourself in the affairs of everyday life that you may please the one who enlisted you as his soldier. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops, which means, Timothy, when that ch uh, church cuts a check to you, you're just like a farmer, that he is fed from his labors. But Paul said to the Corinthians, if we sowed spiritual things, is it too much that we reap temporal things? No, no pastor should be out there starving to death. There's no saying among Christians, God give us a pastor humble and poor. You keep him humble, we'll keep him poor. And that's not what the church is meant to be. Uh, they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentile. Therefore, brethren, we ought to support such men as these. Third John. The church is to be taken care of. This and organizations like it that are biblical, that preach the gospel, those are to be used by the, all of the body of Christ giving to keep it going. In the nation of Israel, that tabernacle curtain was held together by bronze clasps. And the way that those clasps were built, holding it together, was that every single Jew was taxed a shekel that he would give for the upkeep of the temple. In the same way, the upkeep of the body of Christ is by all the believers chipping in and giving what they have. So that's a good purpose of the gospel. It can promote, or the, of money, it can promote the gospel. Now those, quite simply, that's about it. That's what the Bible has to say about money. What's the danger? The danger is whenever materials are seen as, instead of a blessing by God to be used for joy and for benevolence and for spiritual things, to where money owns me. And now, instead of the divine use of materials, I make them my God and I become one of materialism, where it's central. And Paul calls it idolatry. Let me show you a problem with money. If you could look at 1 Timothy 6, The first of the pastoral epistles talks often about the church's use of its financial means. First Timothy 6 and verse 8. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich, meaning their motive in life is money, they fall into temptation and a snare, meaning an unseen problem. The fly lights on the flypaper and says, Aha, my flypaper. The flypaper says, Aha, my fly. I've got him. The desire to make money as your passion in life is called by Paul a snare. It's a danger that you don't see. And here's why. In verse 9, it brings many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root of all evil 
and some by longing for it have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves. That's in the middle voice. They do it themselves. It's like Harry Carey, where you take your own life. They pierce themselves with many a pain. You want to see a progression? It goes like this. Desire, detour, destruction. You've got to be careful about what money can do to you. The problem with money is your God is that money produces three illusions. The number one illusion is that if I have a lot of money, I am successful. That is significance. And folks, that's the graduation message that you and I have heard since we were little. That success is what I wear, what I drive, and where I live. The demonstration of my worth in life by the exhibition of those things which people in my earning category make. I have a dear friend that would not go to his 20th year reunion because he was driving a particular kind of car and not this one. He put his success in what he made. I want to show you the only time in the Bible God calls a man fool. In Luke chapter 12, would you turn there just for a second? The only fellow called fool. In Luke 12 and verse 13, Jesus, after teaching this great discourse upon his coming, a guy in the crowd raised his hand and he asked a question. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Which is like someone saying to a, a professor, Will this be on the test? Or when does this class let out? Or when do we get off for spring vacation? That question had nothing to do with the context. Jesus was teaching. He wanted to use him to manipulate his brother to divide the inheritance more quickly that he could get his hand on his money. I want to use Jesus for my money. And Christ said to him in verse 12, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter over you? I'm not here for such lowly reasons, but seeing as how you ask, verse 15, he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. And here's why you have to beware of greed. Incidentally, the word greed in Greek means play on echo, to have more. Beware of your desire to be insatiable. And here's why. Because not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of possessions. That's why you need to be aware of it. Because we think that if we have things, we have life. Jesus said be on guard because it's not true. Verse 17, or 16, he says once upon a time. The land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? He said, this is what I will do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I'll store all my grain and my goods. You see the great thing about this guy? He is successful, he is hardworking, and he's progressive. He's a good fellow. But there's something about verse 19 that jumps at you. Look at it close. And I will say to my soul, and verse 19 is a rich man's assumption about what he will say when he has, quote, made it. And I will say to my soul, whenever I have built my bigger barns and are just so secure, I will say this. So, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Look close at verse 19. Do you see a materialist's two assumptions? Many goods for many years. Really? Do y'all buy that? If I have a lot of money, I have now the authority to dictate the day of my death. Does money give you the right to do that? Many goods, many years. Also in verse 19, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. The assumption is many goods, happiness. Is that correct? That's his assumption. 
Beloved, what this materialist did was he imputed to money two alien attributes that money doesn't have. Money gives me the ability to enjoy a measure of life, to do good things, to honor God. But it doesn't give me the ability to impart life. So beware, for even when you have a lot of it, you don't get that that you think you're going to get. Because look in verse 20. He said many years. God said to him, and we're in verse uh, yeah, 20, you fool, this very night your soul is required. He said many years. God said tonight. Verse 20, and now who will own what you have prepared? Meaning, I'm going to take your soul and we're going to take all of this wealth that you have and now who's going to get it? You've left it. You've lost it. You got deceived. That's the last sound that a materialist hears is the chuckle of hell. You trusted it and you lost it. Who will own what you have prepared? You ever thought about it? Answer, your kids. Isn't that a terrible note? All of your wealth someday uh, is going to be a garage sale. And your big beautiful house, your kids are going to rent it out to underclassmen over at the college. And they're going to trash it. And then someday Kroger's is going to come in and knock it down and put up a parking lot. Who will own what you have prepared? Eminent domain? Whose then shall these things be? You see, this fellow in this text was very, very highly regarded. And when he died, a lot of people came out to look at this rich man's funeral. But across this man's life, Jesus hangs these words like black crepe. F-O-O-L. Fool. Not because he was an atheist, but he lived like it. So, be careful of the assumption. If I have money, I have happiness. It's not true. Look at 1 Timothy 6 again. Show you another assumption about wealth. The very last paragraph of 1 Tim 6. In verse 11, or verse uh, 17, 1 Tim 6, 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited. Another problem that wealth can have is that it gives you the illusion that my success and money equals character. And you become conceited. You get to thinking that because you have this money, I've acquired this, I am this. Because men pay great attention a lot of times. So wealth gives the illusion of significance and it gives the illusion of character. Let me tell you, I counseled one time a couple in my church, and I could tell you what this guy was the owner of, and most of you here have probably spent 5,000 bucks over the year at his store. They never ever, I counseled them for about eight weeks, this was years ago, they never ever, I don't think, pulled up in the same automobile, and they had some real cars, and they just collected them like toys. Um, they had a house that you could have taken my house and used uh, as a, a closet in their house. Enormous house, sitting on more enormous, rolling, sculpted lawns. Uh, this guy had made it. And yet when I would have them in my office, I would close the door so my family would not be offended at listening to this callous, harsh, unloving, godless, individual lose his temper at his equally sarcastic, 
biting and hateful wife. And they had some children that frankly were not worth the powder it would take to shoot them. <laughs> and you know what? And I kid you not, this guy, this guy had to have made uh, a million bucks every couple of months. And he spent it on what guys that had that money spend it on. I wouldn't, and I am not being pious, I wouldn't trade. We have this, we must be this. But they had no character whatsoever. Lastly, if you look there in verse 17, not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. The term fix your hope is used in Timothy about Jesus Christ. We put all of our trust in his death, resurrection, and his coming. The problem with money is that it can give you the illusion of security. That I have it today, I'll have it tomorrow. And it doesn't work that way. There were fellows years ago in Texas when the real estate and oil was just booming. There were Texas real estate men that would get fellows into their office, I know this for a fact, and to have fun and to entertain them, they would call up Las Vegas to a casino. They'd get the roulette table and they'd put it to the guy's ear and they'd say, give me a number. And they might drop $25,000 over a telephone just to have fun with the guy in the office. And uh, those guys through the 80s uh, lost everything, some of them. You, you can't count on the security. You can't count on the security of your body to be able to function in a task to make that money. It's here today, and it is very rarely gone tomorrow. So those are the illusions of money. If I have money, I must have life, I must have character, and I do have security. Paul says you don't. James, come now, who, you rich, who say today or tomorrow we'll go up to this or that city, engage in business, and make a profit. You don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall go up or do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. And all such boasting is evil. Meaning, you boast in something that is a phantasm. You don't know that you're going to live tomorrow. So how are you doing money-wise? Are you making your money honestly? Are you working hard and being faithful to your employer or your employees? Do you recognize it as something that's a gift from God and you use it for benevolence, to further Christ's work, and to enjoy? Do you worship the God of the heavens, the earth, sea, and the dry land who gave it to you? And is this money being funneled through you and your abilities by God for his purposes? Or is it stagnating in your heart in materialism and poisoning you, your character, and your existence. If that's the case, you may not own your money. Your money may own you. Money flows through us like the Jordan. It does not stagnate in us like the Dead Sea. Make all the money you can in the 40 hours, then you go home and you be with your family. You go home and enjoy life. Use the money you can for great things. May God bless you with a million bucks a month and may his kingdom be promoted greatly through your lives. Some of you, may God bless you with $800 a month if that's what you can make and you can have just as much joy on that money as any place else. Can I tell you something you want to watch sometime if you get a chance? I think that the most Christian movie ever made was Citizen Kane. And it wasn't really made as a Christian movie. It was a takeoff on William Randolph Hearst. And I'll save you 79 cents for the video right here. There's two movies that you never tell everybody what the movie's about. One is Psycho, and the other is Citizen King. But I'm going to violate it. But if, you're, if you saw the movie, and it's called by many, the greatest movie ever made. All cinema turned on Citizen Kane because Orson Welles used the, um, the cinema as a painting 
to give a message. And at the outset of the movie, this very wealthy man dies, and the last word on his mouth is Rosebud. And the point of the movie is you go through the next two hours trying to figure out what Rosebud is. And this reporter interviews everybody that ever talked to this fantastically wealthy newspaper, Citizen Kane. Incidentally, I don't think that the K-A-N-E is meant to be K-A-N-E. It's a takeoff on C-A-I-N, on Citizen Kane, the evil man. And uh, this man takes his money and basically destroys his life, destroys his family, destroys his friends, destroys everything that is precious to him. Uh, and throughout the movie, they never find out who Rosebud is. Until the very last scene. If you saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, the last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark is a takeoff on Citizen Kane, where they take all of this man's possessions and they put them in a fireplace and they burn them. And if you'll watch the movie, you'll notice a motif all the way through the movie is the fireplace motif. There's always a fireplace burning and consuming in this man's life. And the older that he gets, the fireplace in his house gets bigger because his lust grows greater. And in the last scene, there's a fireplace in his majestic palatial house that's as big as a wall. And it's always roaring like his lust. And these uh, workers are taking all of his possessions and throwing them in the fireplace and burning them up. And then they take this one possession. It's a, a sled, a little boy's sled. And the guy looks at it and he thinks, what useless thing is this? And throws it in. And uh, at the beginning of the movie, on the flashback of the man's life, it shows Citizen Kane as a little boy playing in the snow in Colorado on his sled. And it's the little sled that he was playing on as a little boy. He had kept it. And the fire begins to roar around that little sled, and the paint begins to peel, and the camera zooms in. And there you see on the sled, Rosebud. It's the sled. And you waited for two hours for Orson Welles to hit you with that answer. And it grabs you. At the end of this man's debauched, worthless life, the thing that was precious to him was playing in the snow as a little boy on a sled. The simplicity of life. And then you know what the camera does? It all of a sudden backs away and you see his house. And you see coming out of the chimney black smoke boiling up into the heavens as his life is consumed. And then you back further up and there's a chain link fence between you, the viewer, and the house. And you pan back farther and there's a sign. No trespassing. Citizen, C-A-I-N. Citizen Kane. Beware. For not even when one has an abundance of life or of possessions does his life consist of what he owns. Be rich in good works, ready to share, storing up for yourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. First Tim 6. So do you have money? Make it honestly. Use it. Enjoy it. Don't trust it. God never meant it to be trusted. May I say also that our salvation is a financial arrangement. When man sins, he comes in bondage, and there must be a payment. Religion merely is a group of rungs on an imagined, perceived ladder that a man can climb to get out of justice. In God's sight, the ladder does not exist. To get a man out of the condemnation of his own sin, there must be a financial arrangement between God the sinner, and God's justice. The payment to the justice of God is a life, and there is no amount of money that can buy it. And thus does Peter say that we have been purchased, not with perishable things like silver or gold from our futile way of life, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished, the blood of Christ. The payment for our freedom and salvation is commercial. The coin of the realm is a divine life. And Christ paid that for you. The wage of sin 
is his death. And it's been paid by him who said, it's finished. And so might I inform you of that tonight? That the most glorious possession that you can have, that you can never lose, is salvation. And it's out of your price range. It is only paid by the Son of God. What you can do is accept payment. How do you accept payment? Well, the offer is made knee high. And to take it, you have to kneel. You have to bend. You don't do anything. You simply admit what has always been true, that God is there, God is holy, and you and I are not. And the way that we might know him is by his initiative, his activity, and his grace. What he asks of you is honesty, and in that, humility. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me. Take you as my Savior. I receive you into my life. I trust you. I rest my eternal life on your death for me. And Jesus said, He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. If you would like to know him, he has sent back his very spirit to glorify his death and draw men to his knowledge. Would you do that tonight? Well, let's pray. And we'll have Michael come and dismiss us. Our Father in heaven, I thank you so for this evening with my friends, these dear men, these dear ladies that come to study of you. And we've looked at a lot of material, and I pray that you would call it to our remembrance. Thank you for the talents that you have given these people. Thank you for the abilities to earn. I pray that they would indeed recognize that they are stewards of what did not originate nor will terminate with them, but with you. I would ask, Father, for your sake, that they might be wise, that they might use this money, enjoy this money, that this money would be that which can promote good and benevolence and glory. I pray, Father, for the, in, the dangerous virus that we all carry, that we are all have um, flesh of gunpowder that is occasionally touched by the spark of money. And if we are not careful, it can ignite and destroy us. It can give us the illusion that we have life, that we have character, and we have security and hope when indeed we have nothing. I pray that our lives would be devoted to you, to learn of you, to enjoy you, and to serve you. And we'll thank you in the precious and holy name of Christ. And if there is one tonight that would like in the quiet and humility of their heart to accept the judicial and commercial payment of the blood of the Son of God to the righteous demands of the holiness of the Father. Might this very day they behold what he did and with empty hands of faith accept it. Might this be the night of their salvation as they invite Christ 